Well, I am excited to be here and study what we're going to study this morning with you because it really goes with what we studied on Friday night as a church. On Friday, Good Friday, if you remember, we went to Luke 16 and we started our evening that night meditating and thinking on and sustained that thought through the evening on the horrors of hell, how bad it is, how terrible it was and what we've been delivered from. That's what we studied Friday night. And I told you that this morning we'd leave the horrors of hell and this morning we're going to spend our time on the glories of heaven. Literally, it's not an overstatement to say when we're gathering on Resurrection Sunday today, celebrating the empty tomb, it's not an overstatement to say literally every promise of scripture that relates to heaven's glory, that relates to the future kingdom, hinges upon an empty tomb. If Christ did not rise, if he is not risen, if that tomb still had him in it, if he did not conquer death, everything we love and look forward to and anticipate about heaven is mere fantasy. We don't make it to glory if he didn't go first. We don't conquer death if he didn't conquer the grave. And so what I'm going to do here today and spend our time is thinking about heaven in a moment here. Heaven's been on my mind a lot the last couple years. I've been thinking a lot about it, wanting to teach on it, studying a good bit. And I think this happens to us, right? When you have a number of loved ones that you care about face death, faith, face illnesses, or when you lose those that love the Lord and their believers, you're immediately faced with the fact that we're all terminal, right? 10 out of 10 people die. And we're all going to go somewhere, heaven or hell, and those that you love, that love the Lord Jesus Christ, they go to heaven. And if you're like me, you start to envision what will it be like for them when they leave this world and go to the next. I've had a sequence of events that strung that together. Just a few years ago, my mom got very ill. And I, I remember sitting in the hospital with her there. And thankfully, she's doing better now. But at the time, I didn't know if she was going to make it. And I saw her suffering. And I remember sitting there in the hospital contemplating, what would it be like for my mom to cross through the barrier and her faith to become sight? I considered that thought for a while. And then after that, I was called upon to do a, a memorial for a sweet lady named Lola Schattinger. It's not very often you get this privilege as a pastor, but I was able to see the Lord save this woman, Lola, right before my eyes. I saw her walk with Christ, and then we saw her off to glory. But cancer took her too young, and she was taken from her family, and her and I, in those final weeks, spent lots of time talking about what heaven would be like for her. And so my mind was on it again. And then some months back, I had the privilege to go out with my dear brother-in-law, Tim Woodward. His father went to be with the Lord, Woody Woodward. And I, Pastor John MacArthur did that service. And I remember sitting there listening to Pastor MacArthur talk about Woody and his life. And, and then he began to talk about heaven. And he said something along the lines of this, if we truly considered the joy Woody was experiencing right now in heaven, we would never want him to come back. And my mind was taken to heaven again. And then recently, a dear mentor of mine, Dr. George Zemeck, spent 50 years training men in ministry, teaching people at the Masters of Divinity level. And he went to glory just a couple months ago. And all I could think about was what was the line like in heaven to meet Dr. George Zemeck of the congregations of people, of the thousands upon thousands of pastors he had trained and people that had come to Christ through the preaching of the word of those men. I envisioned it going around the streets and down the hallways, just wanting to greet him and say, thank you for training my pastor that led me to Christ. That was on my mind. And then the most recently, my wife's dear grandmother, Emery Britton, beloved saint, dear saint, 60 plus years at Grace Community Church, 40 years she gave oversight to the women's ministry and what struck me about her home going when her faith became sight is that as the Lord took her from this earth to heaven's glory, she was being sung a song by someone you may know, Johnny Erickson Tata. Her and her beloved husband, Sam, had a great relationship with Johnny Erickson Tata. And Johnny was singing to her like a songbird 
No one ever cared for me like Jesus, that old famous hymn. And I envisioned her hearing Johnny singing to her and then leaving this life into the next and joining the choir in heaven that Daniel was just referencing in Revelation 5. And I thought, what that moment must have been. And then most recently, I've been thinking a lot about heaven because our dear brother here in our midst, Daniel Hutchins, 24 years old, very possible the Lord's going to give him many more years, but he does have an incurable brain tumor. And what will we cling to? What will we grasp onto if the Lord decides to take him before our desires would be? Well, I will tell you what we will need. We will need the promises of the resurrection and our confidence of where our brother would go to glory. So heaven's been on my mind a lot. And the next life's been on my life a lot, on my mind a lot. And so that's what I want to spend our time studying today. I want to demonstrate to you from the scriptures how everything that has to do with heaven hinges upon the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm going to show you that in scripture. And then from there, we're going to spend the rest of our time just going to heaven and taking a look at it for a while from the scriptures perspective. So if you would, please turn to 1 Corinthians 15. I want to show you first why the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is the hinge point, the beginning domino, the start of everything. If Jesus does not rise, everything else I say today really doesn't matter. If he did not rise from the grave, then everything in the order of events, from heaven's glory to the second coming to the new heavens and new earth, they all depend on Jesus rising from the grave. You may not realize it, but every time you celebrate the resurrection, you celebrate your confidence of what heaven will be like for you. Notice 1 Corinthians 15, and as we're Looking at it, something you need to uh, understand about this passage. In this passage, when you come to 1 Corinthians 15, the church here is having a little bit of a Q&A with the Apostle Paul. And the church is basically trying to discover essentially this thought. Paul, we understand that Jesus Christ must rise from the grave first and he must have a bodily resurrection. They understand the importance of the resurrection. But then they're asking the question, if Jesus has to rise first and he must rise from the grave, what does that mean for us? Where does that go into play for us? What does that mean for our own bodily resurrection? You say, what do you mean bodily resurrection? Well, sometimes we imagine that when we leave this earth now, that our body and soul go to heaven right now and the heaven that we experience and enjoy right now is the permanent heaven. But the heaven that's existing now is a heaven, it is a paradise, we'll look at it, but it's not the final heaven. The final heaven is the new heavens and the new earth when Jesus Christ comes down with the new Jerusalem, as we'll see today in a little bit, to rule and reign on earth. And at that moment, and the the second coming triggers that, Jesus is going to open up the tombs, as we're going to see in a moment. And he's going to unite believers' souls with their body and fashion them a body fitted for glory to enjoy the new heavens and the new earth. And so the Corinthians are saying, how does that all work? How does it all come together? Jesus' resurrection of his earthly body, my resurrection of my body, how does that work with Christ going back and when do we go to heaven and how does that work with the second coming? Probably like some of you are wondering right now, how does that all work? Well, I'm glad you asked because that's exactly the answer Paul is going to give them. Notice verse 20 of chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. But now Christ has been raised from the dead and he's the first fruits of those who are asleep. Notice that. Christ begins the process and notice the resurrection there. Christ has been raised from the dead and he is first. Note that in your mind. And then look at 21 and 22. For since by a man came death, by a man also comes the resurrection of the dead. That is Jesus Christ's accomplishment so that we conquer death. For in Adam we all die In Christ, we're made alive. What does that mean? In Adam's sin, guaranteed death. In Christ's resurrection, guaranteed victory over death. Okay? Now, you may say, okay, how does that all work? Well, Paul says, well, there's an order, and we should consider it. Verse 23. But each in his own order. Notice this. Christ has to go first. Verse 23. Christ is the first fruits, he rises, and then after that, those who are in Christ at his coming. Notice that. Christ rises first, and he conquers the grave, 
But then the resurrection of our bodies come, notice, at the second coming. You may say, well, what does that all mean? What about this gap between Christ who's risen now and the second coming of Christ? I live in that time. What does that mean now? Well, I said, souls in heaven right now have some form of body to be able to enjoy worship and praise the Lord and enjoy heaven's paradise, but they are longing for, they are waiting for their earthly body to be repurposed, refashioned, and fitted for glory and united with them. And when does that happen? Look at the text, the end of 23, at his second coming. John 5, 28 and 29 says, do not marvel at this. You can just jot this down. John 5, 28 and 29. An hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and they will come forth. Those who did good deeds to a resurrection of life and those who committed evil deeds to the resurrection of judgment. Now, If we're just going in the order of things, Christ begins this process. He rises from the grave. He purchases and secures that we will have a bodily resurrection that's united with our spirit. And then notice verse 24. Then comes the end. There it is. Then comes the new heavens and the new earth. And notice he documents the kingdom. Verse 24, then comes the end when he, Jesus, hands over the kingdom, that's the future kingdom, to God the Father, and they abolish all rule and all authority and all power. What is that shorthand for? Jesus whoops up on Satan, takes out his demons, eradicates all evil, and sets up the new heavens and the new earth. And believers who have died... Their bodies are in the grave, their souls are in heaven, and the tombs open up, and when all that comes together, when the new heavens and new earth, they're united, the earth, their bodily resurrection with their spirit who's in heaven, a body fashioned for worship for eternity. Beloved, if Jesus doesn't rise, none of that happens, not one of those events. <laughs> There's no resurrection of us. There's no security of our salvation. There's no new heavens and new earth. There's no second coming. There's no future in heaven. Everything about the future event hinges upon the fact that Jesus rose. If you don't believe Jesus rose from the grave, then you can just give up on everything else that you'd look for in the future. Like you can't say, oh, I can't wait to go to heaven, but I'm not so sure about the literal bodily resurrection of Jesus. I don't know if the facts line up. They they must coexist. (laughs) If you reject the resurrection, then you can just give up on heaven. You can give up on the second coming. You can give up on anything. It's fantasy. But if he did rise, if he did conquer death, if he did beat the grave, then all of our future, every step of the way has an order and a step and those events are unfolding and they result in our arrival in glory. So with that in view, now I want to spend the rest of our time to think about two questions. The resurrection of Jesus Christ purchased us and accomplished for us, his death, burial, and resurrection are guaranteed to make it to heaven. And so I just want to ask two questions of the Bible this morning. The Bible tells us what to ask by telling us what it teaches, right? We sometimes ask lots of questions about heaven. Will I be bored in heaven? Will my pet go to heaven? You know, what's it going to be like up there? Am I floating on a cloud with a harp? What's really going on? We ask all kinds of questions that aren't given exact answers in scripture, but scripture tells us what questions to ask because scripture tells us what it wants us to know. And so here's the two questions I want to ask this morning. What will I be like in heaven and what will heaven be like? That's it. What will I be like in heaven and what will heaven be like? It's not a small undertaking to consider all of those answers to these questions in one sermon, but we will try and do it together, okay? Okay. So question one, what will I be like in heaven? Well, notice Paul had some people in Corinth asking the same question. Look at verse 35. But someone will say, how are the dead raised and what kind of body do they come with? Maybe you were sitting here saying, okay, I heard you say all that stuff about the resurrection and and my soul being united with my body, but how does that all work? Well, in Corinth, they were going, how does that all work? And so in 35, someone says, how are the dead raised? What does this look like when the second coming comes and the new heavens and the new earth is going to be set up and the soul is united with the body? How does that work? Well, notice Paul answers it in 51 to 57. What a sweet section. Notice it. Verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. There it is, second coming. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised 
Notice this, imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must become imperishable. The mortal must become immortality. But when there is a perishable, we will put on the imperishable. And the mortal, we will put on immortality. Then will come about and we will be saying, it is written, death is swallowed up in victory. The refrain of the sinner who conquers death and makes it to glory and unites with their glorified body says to death, you have no sway over me. Victory on the basis of the resurrection. Notice 55, oh death, where is your victory? Oh death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through Jesus Christ. Now, notice in that text there, our eternal body that's going to be fashioned for heaven, fashioned for glory, is described as imperishable. It's described as immortal. It's described as victorious. That is to say, it can't fade, it can't age, it can't decay. If you're wondering, what will I be like in the ultimate new heavens and the new earth? You will be fashioned with and given a body by our Lord, transformed into in, in, into an eternal entity where your soul and your body are united and what comes together, notice, is imperishable. It's made to last forever. You say, what's its image? Well, it's the image of God, just like Jesus Christ, just like we have now. Look at verse 49. Just as we've been born in the image of the earthly, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. Meaning, sometimes we imagine we're floating spirits going around heaven. No, you will very much have a body. You will very much have a body made to worship. You will have a body made to work, a body made to honor and serve the Lord, a body made to fellowship, a body made to use your gifts. And it will be very much like the bodies you have now, minus one thing. No effects of sin. None. See, the only one that has scars in heaven are the redemptive scars of Christ, right? His resurrected body. Thomas wanted to say, hey, I'll see if I believe. And Jesus said, well, here's me and my resurrected body. And he's got hand, nails in his hands, holes in his hands and his side. Those are redemptive scars. The rest of us in glory, we will have a body that is transformed into a heavenly body with no effects of sin, no deformity, no disease, and it's body and mind. No brain fog, no issues, no genetic issues, no molecule mutations, a perfectly heavenly body and mind ready for eternity, given to you by the Lord to worship him forever. You think about that. The people that die, riddled with disease, their body eradicated by some cancer. You think about the people that spend all their lives crippled and and with all kinds of difficulties and deformities, God's going to take all of that and eradicate it. Why? Because all of that is the effects of sin. Sin from the fall affects humanity. Guess what happens in sin? No effects, I mean in, in heaven, excuse me. No effects of sin. Philippians 3.21, how does that happen? Jesus will transform the body of our humble state into the conformity of his body, of his glory, by the exertion of his power. Look, and it's not only that it's going to be the absence of sin and no deformity and a, and, a, and a vibrant body made for heaven, fashioned for worship, fitted for eternity, in eternal existence, one body given to you with your soul. It's going to be a body full of vitality and strength and vibrancy. Matthew 13, 43. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. There it is. We have all these misconceptions about going to heaven and we're floating spirits. You are very much going to have a glorified body, very similar to the one you have now, but with no effects of sin. We wouldn't even know what that's like because all we've known is the effects of sin. We've never even seen a person with a body with no effects of sin because we didn't get to see Adam and Eve before the fall. We have no idea the type of humanity God made before sin corrupted it all. But in heaven, we will. <laughs> you will very much walk around and live in heaven, very similar to your existence now, but with absolute perfection. You know, what hope that is for the believer. No other religion offers that. I like what Johnny Erickson Tata said. You may know at 17 years old, she had a diving injury and was paralyzed from the neck down and became a paraplegic. And she has said all of her life, the hope of having a resurrected body 
is what has kept her going on and kept her giving hope to others. A future resurrected body that's perfect. Here's what she said. I can still hardly believe it. I, with shriveled, bent fingers, atrophied muscles, gnarled knees, I have no feeling from my shoulders down. And yet one day, I will have a new body, light and bright and clothed in righteousness. I'll be powerful and dazzling. Can you imagine that hope that gives someone like me with a spinal cord injury or someone with cerebral palsy or a brain injury or multiple sclerosis? Can you imagine the hope that gives someone like us? No other religion, no other philosophy promises new bodies, new hearts, and new minds. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ can offer that to hurting people and give them such incredible hope, end quote. Dear ones, everything that you carry with you today that makes you feel sick and weak and feeble and insecure and troubled and the things you don't like about yourself and the things that are affected by sin and all these kinds of things that bother you, that you, the effects of the fall, whatever they are, in the twinkling of an eye, in a moment when the trumpet sounds and you're united with your soul in heaven, in the new heavens and the new earth, all that will be gone. And what you will be like in heaven is absolutely glorified, ready for an eternity with a vibrant body, ready to serve and worship the Lord. That's awesome. So if you ask the question, what will I be like in heaven? I will be very much like I am now, but with absolutely zero effects of sin, recreated and refashioned for immortality, joy, worship, and fellowship. That's your future. You tell that to someone who's dying with a debilitating disease. I have sat with people at their bedsides who some disease is eating away at their body and been able to say to them, someday. <laughs> God is going to recreate all of this and gather it all up and re-put it back together to make you glorified. And I think of saints, you know, I think of burned saints. You know, people hate um, the gospel and they go and say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to take out this guy and you know what we'll do? We'll eradicate him from earth and we're going to burn him up and his ashes are going to fly everywhere. Well, guess what? The Lord Jesus is going to come gather all that back up. <laughs> Put it all back together for a glorified body ready to worship. No particle left out. Everything recreated. Because Jesus is in the business of recreating the new heavens and the earth and making it perfect. And recreating our, our body to put it together with our soul for eternity. So that answers our first question. What will I be like in heaven? That's what you'll be like. Second question. This will be the rest of our time. What will heaven be like? If that's what I'll be like. What will heaven be like? Well, turn to Luke 23 to start there. Do a little survey here. Remember, we need to get a little bit of a running start because the current state of heaven is different than what's gonna be the final state of heaven of the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem when God literally takes heaven to earth and recreates it and sets up his kingdom on earth. And by the time we're done, you're gonna see it all. So the current state that believers that have died are in is still a paradise. How do we know that? Because that's what Jesus calls it. You remember Luke 23, verse 43. Jesus is there talking to the uh, thief on the cross. And the thief on the cross repents of his sin and puts his faith in Christ. And it's interesting, notice verse 42. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in, there it is, paradise. Paradise. Now just as a side free sermon, there is some views sometimes that when Jesus died in the three days between his death and his resurrection, he went to hell and preached to the spirits. And there's a whole bunch of the view on Peter. But I think it's a little bit problematic from this text because Jesus doesn't say he's going to hell. He says he's going to heaven that day. Truly, I say to you, today I'll be with you in paradise. That's where he's going. Heaven. So there was an empty tomb, of course, but we could assume Jesus spent that time in glory, at least his spirit, before he went back to his body and rose Certainly some of this is conjecture. We don't have the answers to all of those mysteries. 
Nevertheless, let's consider paradise. So right now we could say heaven is called paradise. Well, it's interesting. Paradise, that language, certainly has the idea of something that we describe paradise. A part of nature that's stunning and grabs all your five sensors and overcomes you with this vivid um, sense of color, shape, smells. It's, it's euphoric a bit. Paradise. It speaks of perfection. It speaks of holiness. It speaks of absolutely the absence of sin. Do you know where that word is used, paradise? It's used in the Hebrew translation of your Old Testament in Genesis 2 to speak of the Garden of Eden. So if you're wondering, what is paradise like? You can go pre-fall in Genesis 3. Well, in the garden, there was no sin. It was an absolutely holy place. So we could just say this about heaven, just to start by introduction. Heaven is a place with no sin and absolute perfect holiness. I'll get to the paradise piece more in a moment. Explain that. But if you think about that, if heaven is a holy place with the absence of sin, nothing in heaven is affected by sin, this paradise here, that would mean that the only reason you would want to be in a place like that is if you love holiness, right? You could say, I want to go to heaven, but I don't love holiness. That's just you saying, I don't want the discomforts of hell, but I don't really love God. To love God is to love holiness. To love heaven is to love holiness. If you want heaven without holiness, you don't want the right heaven. Heaven is also a place, as we'll look at, as a place of worship, a place of adoration. This paradise, if you go back to Adam and Eve, they were worshipers, and we're going to go forward to the future, and there's worshipers. So we could say this, if you don't like worship, you really won't like heaven. But let's consider paradise a little bit more. Paradise speaks to that which most thrills our hearts, thrills our senses, and overwhelms us with a sense of satisfaction, a euphoria, a perfection in creation. In fact, Revelation 2.7 takes that idea of paradise, listen to this, and says, I will grant to you to eat from the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. I want you to think about something. Paradise, speaking of the Genesis account, And in a moment, we're going to see paradise in the new heavens and the new earth. It speaks to what Eden like, what the Garden of Eden would have been like. It speaks to what the most amazing images you could ever see in your mind of mountaintops and of rivers and of oceans and of lakes. The most stunning scenes you could imagine in your mind with the perfect climate and the perfect habitat and the perfect food and the perfect taste and everything coming together with absolute perfection. It speaks to that. You and I have never seen a place like that. You know why? We've never seen a humanity not touched by sin. Think about this. Everything you see, even if you went to your favorite destination in the world where you're like, this is paradise, and look at those mountaintops and those peaks and these berries and these flowers and the the landscape and the climate, and this is paradise. Realize this. Everything you're looking at is still cursed. God cursed the earth in Genesis 3. Romans 8, says, For we know the whole creation is groaning and suffering under pain until now. Creation's waiting to be redeemed. Will you think about how devastating the effects of sin are on things, right? Sin makes everything ugly. Sin makes things that are beautiful look horrible. So imagine the most beautiful thing you can see in your life and realize that when you're looking at that paradise, it's still touched by sin. Heaven is a place where everything you could imagine, the paradise that you could imagine in your mind, the most beautiful, scenic place you could put in your mind, realize that's marred by sin and the curse. And when I get to heaven, it will be a billion times better than what I could see in that because it will be untouched by sin. Wow. Not only that, Everything that we eat and partake in, everything that we enjoy, flavors and tastes and smells and sounds, all affected by sin. The things that we would say would paradise wouldn't even compare to what heaven's going to be like. In fact, what I'm looking forward to most, I love mangoes. I really can't wait to have a glorified mango. I mean, just the thought of biting into a glorified mango. Man. Yesterday, my wife made smoothies and she brought one to me while I was studying and I took a drink of it and I thought, what? That is good, but what will that be like in heaven? Wow. 
Everything in heaven is going to go so far beyond our wildest dreams because everything here is affected by sin. God created everything in heaven for his people's joy, for his people's honor, for his people's glory, for them to exalt him. Psalm 6, uh, Isaiah 65, 18. For behold, I create in Jus Jerusalem everything for rejoicing and for his people's gladness. Now, if we think about the garden and you think, okay, that's good to think about. And I paint this picture of paradise a bit. And you think about that. But there's something missing in the current heaven, in the future heaven, if you think about the garden. Like a couple billion people. And an amazing city manufactured and crafted by the architect that is God that's in the middle of this paradise. So now you have the most amazing paradise you could ever think of with a city that I'm going to explain to you in a moment that is beyond any city that's ever been built. And guess what? It's not like cities now where it's got traffic and smog and, you know, dirt and grime and graffiti and everything you don't like about a city. It's a city made by God, untouched by sin, in absolute perfection, in the middle of this paradise that goes on for millions of miles with a few billion people there. You're starting to get a picture here of heaven. I mean, it's mind-blowing. Now, we're not to the new heavens and the new earth yet, so what about believers now? Well, turn to John 14, for a moment. Believers now, even though they don't have their final location in the new heavens and the new earth, Jesus is still freshening up some rooms for him. John 14, verse 2. Notice, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. So, Father's house, heaven. Many rooms is the idea. If it were not so, I would not have told you. For I go to prepare, prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you will be also. So Jesus is telling the disciples, I'm going ahead. And it's not yet the new heavens and the new earth finally there. But he is preparing them some type of room and board. Some type of place for them to dwell and enjoy fellowship. And enjoy worship. And enjoy meals and feasts as we'll see in a moment in Glory. So keep that in your mind. Paradise, rooms being prepared. We're heading to the new heavens and the new earth. And now let's think about how many people are going to be in heaven. What's it going to be like? Millions, billions of people? How do we know? Look at Hebrews 11. Notice Hebrews 11. Verse 10, I love this language. The city that is to come. God's city. Notice verse 10. For he was looking for a city which has as its foundation, whose architect and builder is God. I don't think anybody's out building, building him. I don't think anybody's crafting and manufacturing a better city than God. And you think, well, how big does the city have to be that the Lord's going to build? It's going to be real big. Look at verses 11 and 12. By faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life since she has considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, look at verse 12. There were born even of one man and him as good as dead as many and many descendants come from him. And how many descendants come from the line of Abraham that will be in the new heavens and the new earth that will fill up glory in heaven? How many, beloved, as the stars of heaven in number and as innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. Wow, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of worshipers. And you think a city with that many people? That sounds crowded and it's got traffic and it's going to be, no, 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 no. That's all the effects of the fall. <laughs> if you don't know that, we can talk later. Look at it. As much as the stars of the heaven and as innumerable as the sand of the sea, beloved. Think about that. This is stunning. Imagine a city so large that billions of people that love the same Christ, have the same theology, in perfect harmony, worshiping King Jesus together for eternity. 
Every believer you know that passes this life and goes into the current state of heaven that's paradise and is waiting for the new heavens and the new earth, they are encountering thousands and millions and millions of saints and believers that have been saved all the way back through redemptive history. What a reunion it must be when we enter into heaven. Wow. Paradise, rooms, city, Turn to Revelation 21. Let's get the full picture of this now. The new heavens and the new earth. We're going to fill this out. This goes back to where I started with you in 1 Corinthians 15. When the end comes and Jesus sets up his reign in the new Jerusalem and there's a throne and there's a king, which is Jesus, and there's a kingdom and there's a people and they're reigning and ruling in the new heavens and the new earth. I want you to see how amazing this is. Beloved, all this that I've said hinges upon the resurrection being true. (laughs) Look at verse 1 of Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heavens and a new earth. Okay, this is the final, the final place where believers would dwell forever. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away. There it is. He recreates it and there's no longer any sea and people panic there and go, what? Heaven with no ocean? Well, we don't really know all that he's saying, but we know this. In a moment, we're about to see a massive river go through this massive city and rivers run into lakes and maybe that that river's as big as an ocean and there's lakes. I don't know, but I can tell you it'll be far beyond what you could imagine. You won't be missing the ocean, especially not the Texas ocean. (laughs) Verse two, and I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. What a scene. And I heard a loud voice from a throne saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is among us. There it is, Jesus. And he will dwell with them and he shall be his people and God himself will be among them. And then notice verse four, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. First things have passed away. You know what happens in heaven, beloved? In the current heaven and the future heaven. You know what? There's no more burdened prayer requests. It's only praise reports. There's no more sin and suffering. There's no more insecurity. There's no more fear. There's no more anxiety. There's no more selfish ambition. There's no more fear of man. There's no more anger. There's no more vulnerabilities where you feel depressed and despondent and abandoned and betrayed. There's no more battle in the heart. There's no more temptation. It's all gone. You're perfect. It's wiped away. And you're just there to worship and live for the glory of God. Man, is that not like the best part about heaven? No death, no pain, no tears, no conflict, no battle, no restless soul. Just Jesus dwelling with his people. John fills this out. This is the apostle John here fills this out. Look at verse 10 now. Notice, and he carried me away in the spirit. I'm in verse 10 of chapter 21. And the great high mountain, and he showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down of heaven from God, having the glory of God. His brilliance was like a very costly stone, a stone of a crystal clear jasper, and a great and high wall with 12 gates, and the gates 12 angels, and the names were written on them, which were the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. Then there were three gates on the east, and three gates on the north, and three gates on the south, and three gates on the west, and the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and all of them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. A lot of detail here. The one who spoke to me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and check out these measurements. The city is laid out in a square and its length is as great as its width. So north, south, east, west, the same. And he measured the city with rod 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. And he measured its wall 72 yards according to human measurements, which are also angelic. If you're wondering where are those billions of people going to go, let me give you a little picture of how big this city is going to be in the middle of this paradise. 14,000 miles in length and width. So north, south, east, west, 14,000 miles. That's like north to south going from Canada to Mexico and east to west from North Carolina to California. And that's just going, that's just going, you know, in our up and down and side to side, of course. And if you take all that together, the ground level alone, when you don't start considering the upper levels, because it goes 14,000 miles high, just the ground level is 2 million square miles. 
I think there'll be some elbow room. <laughs> What's amazing about that city is that city is put into the middle of the paradise that's recreated with the new heavens and new earth. Look at chapter 22, verse 1. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and the Lamb. In the middle of the streets, on either side of the river, was the tree of life. Look at the fruit production, the, 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 the absolute ongoing benefit of the perfect climate, perfect habitat, perfect weather, perfect everything. It yields, it's all kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were the, the healing of the nations. There was no longer any curse and the throne of God and the lamb will be in it. His bond servants will serve him. Wow. That's pretty amazing. You may say, well, we have work in heaven. Well, we have things to do. We have a body and it's fashioned for glory and I'm there to worship. Are we just gonna sit and go to the Revelation 5 moment we'll see in a moment and sing glory be to God? No, that's one major thing we'll do. But you will also have purposes that God's given you to do. You say, work in heaven, I don't like work. No, you don't like work because work was cursed. And everything you touch since Genesis 3 gets very little benefit. Work was in the garden before sin. And you have people working right here in verse 3. Notice, there is no longer be any curse and the throne of God and the lamb will be in it and his bond servants will serve him. You've got people serving the king, serving the lamb around the throne there. You say, what's that look like to serve in heaven? Think about it. Everything you do now is touched by sin. Everything you do there is for the glory of God and it only has blessing. <laughs> we don't know ultimately what all of it will be like, but we know this, God's gonna fashion you a body for glory. He's given you gifts. He's given you spiritual gifts. He saved you and made you into a believer uh, that has a packaging of your old strengths and your new strengths in the Lord and the spiritual packaging of that and you use them in the church and in glory, he's gonna grab all that together in some way and use you for his purposes, for his glory, for his honor and his dominion and we will rule with him and reign with him. I joked with my grandfather-in-law after his uh, dear wife, Emery, went to be with the Lord. I said, you'll know where to find her. Don't worry. When you get to heaven, you'll be able to find her. Because you just got to go down a street that looks very well decorated for hospitality. And then you just got to find the door, whatever room she's in, that has the best looking front porch area that's most decorated. You'll know that's Emery Britton's room. I said that because God takes all of that and in heaven we are going to worship, which we'll look at in a moment. We're going to live for his glory, but we're also going to be working. We're going to be using our gifts to honor him for all of eternity, for the sake of the glory of his name. You say, heaven doesn't need any of that. Of course not. But God loves giving his people purpose. Loves giving his people things to accomplish and do for his name, for his honor and glory. Not only that, you know what else we're going to do a lot of in heaven? Fellowship and eat. We're going to do a lot, but, but the food's not going to be anything like what we taste now because it'll have no effects of sin and you'll have perfect taste buds with the perfect capacity and the perfect nutrition to be able to receive every bit of it and enjoy every bite. In Luke 19.9, if you look at it, they're having a feast. I mean, sorry, not Luke, sorry. Revelation 19.9, notice they're having a feast. Notice verse 9, the marriage supper of the lamb. That's a pretty good indication. But how about what our Lord says? Luke twenty two eighteen, 18. He tells his disciples, I'm not going to drink this wine with you. I'm not going to partake in this final Passover meal. However, fellas, <laughs> I say to you, I will not drink until the kingdom of God comes and we'll dine together again. Or how about this? In heaven, Jesus tells us, we not only get to spend time with him, but we get to spend time with the patriarchs having a meal together. Matthew 8, 11, I say to you, many will come from the east and the west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Well, that'll be a nice dinner. Banquets, meals, fellowship, relationships. Dear ones, think about that. God created us for relationships with him and with others. In heaven, just imagine this. Imagine, like, what are you doing this week? Well, I'm trying to go pick out my favorite reformers from church history. I'm going to find Calvin and Wycliffe and Bunyan and Knox and Luther and see if I can talk to them about their time. And then I got to pick up some time with Noah and, you know, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus and Zechariah. And man, 
A lot of people to get to in the next couple thousand years. Fellowship and meals of time. And you know what we're probably going to enjoy the most? We've been given a mind that allows us to take everything we remember, all of our memories from earth. And when we get to heaven, those will all be redemptive. We will be able to see everything through God's lens. We don't just get washed. It's not like you get to heaven and it's like, Shh, everything's gone. No, you will see and remember everything, but through the redemptive lens of God, the way God used it for his glory, the way he used it for his honor. In Revelation 7, we won't go there, but you see the martyred saints remembering things about their time on earth. You know that all that I could think about? A big banquet meal with everybody in my family line that God's been saving for thousands of years. Wow, that would be awesome. Could you imagine sitting there with all your loved ones that you know and love Christ and everyone in your family history that knows Christ and you're sitting around this big banquet table in this paradise, in this city of God and each one of you are going around saying, now tell me how God saved you again. Oh, you wouldn't believe the redemptive work of God. And how did he sustain you? Oh, this season he sustained me here. And how did he make sure you made it to glory? Oh, you should have seen what God did here. And we're going to see the inner weaving of relationships and providence and God's sovereignty and his goodness and his love. And we're going to talk for hours and hours and hours and hours just enjoying fellowship with each other, eating and fellowshipping. I don't think we think about heaven like that. You know, it does go to something. Those of you that love body life in a real local church, those of you that move house and home, drive far distances to be in a healthy church, to learn the truth, to have fellowship, that is a little bit of inside of you of longing for what heaven's gonna be like all the time. You see, church life is actually a picture and a reflection of heavenly life. It just still has the effects of sin. Worship, studying, learning, fellowshipping, rejoicing, remembering, praising, Again, like I said, if you don't like the local church, you're not going to like heaven. But if you love fellowship and you love God's people and you make sacrifices, just what fills your heart more than anything is knowing the truth, learning the truth, and rejoicing and praising God with other believers, you are well prepared for glory. And by the way, we're going to keep learning in heaven. We're not omniscient. We don't know everything. And did you know that the scriptures go to heaven with us? Psalm 119.89, your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your soul and the scriptures are going to glory. 1 Peter 1, 24. All flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. You know what that means? We're gonna keep learning about Christ for all eternity. Learning about the scriptures. In fact, you're gonna learn from other people and the Lord in eternity. You're going to keep learning and growing and worshiping. You, you don't go into this. Heaven's not like this mindless place where you go, bzzz, you know, and I float on a cloud and I go around and, you know, this is, this is what Satan probably wants to do to make people not long for it. Oh, you are going to have a, an active mind in the truth. But there is one thing. You probably know this. There'll be vibrant fellowship, but there won't be marriage. Matthew 22, verse 30, for the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but they are like angels. You may say all that fellowship and all that joy and I don't have marriage. The scriptures say that in the gospels, there's no marriage. I've told Bethany, it really doesn't matter. I'm still gonna chase you all over the clouds, wherever we're going, I'm still gonna try and find you. And I told her this morning, I'm still gonna get a room next to you. I like what one author said. The purpose of marriage is not to replace heaven, but to prepare us for it. Why? Why? Because think of everything you love about your spouse and all that is good and righteous and, and that you're able to enjoy in fellowship and now remove sin, remove hurt feelings, remove bad communication, remove harsh words, remove a lack of love. It's perfect unity. Some of you are saying, I maybe need that a little sooner. Speed that up. There's no marriage in heaven, but your relationship with your spouse will be the sweetest it's ever been in Christian friendship, Christian love, Christian unity, and you'll have your entire past together that will just build on as you enjoy unity together for eternity. I haven't even got to the best part of heaven. You know what the best part of heaven is? Revelation 22.4, look at it. They will see 
his face. Let me just say it again a little slower. They will see his face. Exodus 33, 18 to 23 says, no one looks on God and lives. Moses told us that. Moses was only allowed to see a little flash of the Lord without dying. When you get to heaven, you will be perfectly holy and you will be able to look right in the eyes of your created, your heavenly father, eye to eye. Your full affirmation and love for him and him looking right back at you with his full affirmation and love for you. You will get to look in the eyes of Jesus Christ, your savior, face to face and your faith will become sight. And you know what? There'll be no fear, there'll be no shame, there'll be no anxiety, there'll be no worrying about your sin, there'll be no shrinking back. You will just literally look him in the eyes and he will look back at you and it'll be a moment of pure, unhindered fellowship with God. Wow. You know, now when we live, you know, we have some moments of sweet fellowship and we seek the Lord in his word and we seek him in prayer and we seek him in the scriptures and we turn from sin and we battle and we have these little moments of fellowship, but then they're met by anxieties and fears and insecurities and despondency and I get distracted and then I'm, I, I get convicted of my sin. I feel exposed and not in heaven. That's all gone. It's just face to face. Look at it. They will see his face. The Puritans called this a beatific vision. When we get to heaven or a loved one you know goes to heaven, you just remind them that the best part is you're going to look in the eyes of your Savior. You're going to look at God the Father and he's going to be absolutely affirming of you on the basis of what? You trusted in the crucifixion and resurrection of his son. And Jesus will say, you trusted in me. I mean, what a moment to see the Lord face to face. Psalm 1611, in your presence is fullness of joy. Heaven is a place of rest, joy, excitement, face-to-face fellowship with the Lord. Can you imagine? I mean, just think about it. Can you imagine looking at pure holiness and being a vessel of pure holiness and a moment of absolute purity and holiness? Well, our time is gone and I haven't even gotten to the last thing we do in heaven, which is in Revelation 5, but you won't be surprised by this because Daniel actually introed me to this. Turn to Revelation 5. The last thing we're going to do in heaven is we're going to worship and sing to the Lord. And we're going to sing loudly. In fact, what these ladies and Daniel and the team and the men gave us, I sat there thinking, what would it be like when I was sitting there to have that plus billions Do you know what Sunday mornings are at church? They're just dress rehearsals for glory. Sundays are dress rehearsals for glory. I say it again. If you don't love the things of the church, you're really not going to like heaven. Revelation 5, 9 to 13. Daniel read it earlier. Look at verse 9. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. And you know the picture here is of Christ and his redemption. And notice he was slain by God and his blood purchased us to redemption. And he rose. And I love it. He purchased people from every tribe and language and people and nation. Every people group there. Martyrs and saints. Angels all coming together in one throne. One, verse 12. In one loud voice saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. All of eternity, every day, every moment, all the time, we will have opportunities to come together with a choir and we'll all be able to sing. I can't wait to be able to sing. I'm so excited to be able to sing and it sound good. I love to sing. It just doesn't sound good. I will have a glorified voice. I am so excited about that. Sin affects my voice. Notice verse 12, in a loud voice they were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power. And then 13, then I heard every creature in heaven on earth and under earth and on the sea and all them saying, to him who sits on the throne is the lamb, praise and honor and glory and power forever. We are gonna be in a heavenly choir enjoying worship. Can you imagine what I just described? Fellowship, joy, rest, refreshment, paradise, an architect of the city, which is God, absolute Un, un, uh, never experienced levels of uh, uh, euphoria of all the five senses, unmitigated worship. I love what Isaac Watts, the hymn writer, says. 
How divinely full of glory and pleasure shall the hour be when all the millions of mankind that have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb, God shall meet together and they shall stand around him with every tongue and every heart full of joy and praise. How astonishing will the glory and joy of the day be when all the saints shall join together in one common song of gratitude and love of the everlasting thankfulness of the redeemer. Dear ones, and guess how long all this lasts? Forever. The people in hell know it's never going to end and they'll be there forever and it's misery. The people in heaven know I'm going to be here forever and it just adds to their joy. All of that hinges on the fact that Jesus rose from the grave. Hallelujah, he's risen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for my friends. Thank you for heaven. Oh, Lord. I've never been more afraid of hell and more excited for heaven in one week. I'm so thankful for your word. I'm so thankful for these saints. I'm so thankful for our people that love you, that love church, that love worship, that love your word, that love fellowship, that love the truth. Lord, we are so excited to someday be with you in glory forever. May this fill our people's hearts so they do Colossians 3 says and set their mind on things that are above. Lord, if there's anybody here today that doesn't know if they've put their faith in Jesus Christ and repented of their sins and they wonder if they really even like the things of the Lord the way I describe it, I pray you would crush them. They'd repent and they'd be saved. What a horrible day it would be for them to go to the judgment. What a glorious day it would be to see them added to the choir of billions singing to Jesus. Amen.